So Mr. Richards, thank you for taking the time to speak with us about Moran versus Household International. Uh, it's difficult to speak about a household without also mentioning Unical. And you were involved in both of those cases, both of which were argued within days of each other. Before we get into Household and Unical, can you just give us a little bit of background about what the, what the era was like, what your, what your position was in the firm at the time, kind of the general sense of what was going on? Well, that was the, the middle of, I would say, a very uh, dynamic period where there were many, many uh, cases. Uh, at the time, I guess, uh, I figured out I was about 48 years old. So in my career, that was in the middle of my career or the height of my career. Uh, and uh, I think the Unical case was probably the fifth or sixth case that I had handled for Boone Pickens in Mesa. So it was in the middle of that. Uh, it was 1985. The takeover wars, as we thought about them, uh, started about uh, 1980. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, very busy time for our firm. And what was the firm like before kind of the takeover era? Well, uh, I guess when I joined the firm in uh, 1963, uh, I was a 14th lawyer. And uh, so it was a, a small firm, uh, probably bigger than it would have been in, in some other uh, town because the Delaware Corporation law had a presence and mm -hmm. we had derivative suits and class action uh, suits here. But it wasn't at all as busy as it became. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your involvement in the overhaul of the general corporation law. Oh, well, that was a very uh, fortunate thing for me, although at the time it didn't seem so great. Uh, uh, we're talking about the 1967 yes. revision, and I was just a young fellow. I'd been you know, practicing uh, three or four years. And I was uh, drafted to be a secretary along with uh, Charlie Crompton from Potter, Ames, and Croon and Walt Stapleton, who then became Judge Stapleton, uh, from Morris Nichols. And we were the three uh, dog's bodies, if you will, for the senior partners in those firms. Uh, but what it meant was the, uh, the group met on uh, uh, Saturday mornings at one of the three firms. And so every Saturday morning, uh, instead of uh, playing tennis or, or playing with my children, I was down here revising the corporation law for about uh, a year and a half. And so as I look back at the old correspondence files and the minutes of, of those meetings overhauling the general corporation law uh, in 1967, there are a series of letters you know, from you and to you and, and, and addressed to Mayshores, Cravath, Swain, and more. I mean, how did, did that experience in and of itself kind of expand your own horizons into these firms, give you, an, you know, kind of an in with some of these other firms throughout the country with whom you ended up working in all these takeover cases? Oh, tremendously. Uh in working with the three most senior guys, uh, Dick Caroon, Sam Arsht, and Henry Camby of our firm, you know, I was sitting at the feet of the guys who knew the most about it mm -hmm. and had the most uh, clients and the most uh, experience. And in getting involved with their friends and associates in the national practice of corporation law, and Delaware tried to uh, coordinate or at least be in touch with what the rest of the corporate bar wanted to do, it was uh, invaluable to me and, and gave me more knowledge than you would ever learn in a corporation law uh, course at law school. Mm -hmm. And it, it is interesting that you do have that background because while ultimately we think of, of Moran as, as kind of a case that turned on the equities, there were a lot of technical arguments, uh, including whether the rights plan was valid under 157, including whether it was an impermissible restriction on shares under uh, Section 202. There were a lot of different technical arguments, although you know, ultimately I think the case really didn't turn on that. It really did turn on kind of the equities of it and, and in many respects, Unical at the end of the day. Um, and so I want to now kind of turn to what it was like for you specifically as you're marching toward uh, your argument in household and, and how you were able to manage your schedule given that you were arguing uh, Unical just a few days before and you were otherwise very busy. What was, what was that circumstance like? Well, uh, 
for those particular cases and, and for that period of time, I usually uh, operated as, a, as a, the captain, if you will, of a, of a pretty good sized team and uh, very good size for our firm. And uh, we would have as many as uh, 10 or even in parts of Unical, 15 people working on it because so much had to be done in 24 or 48 hours overnight. You know, the briefs on appeal in Unical, for example, I think were written overnight, 24 <laughs> hours. Uh, so that was frantic. Also, there were other matters that came in, and uh, which I couldn't pay much attention to, so I had to recruit uh, other partners to work on them, but still, uh, if I had the relationship with the client, I had to spend, uh, you know, a few minutes uh, during the day on that. The, uh, an, an interesting aspect that we were talking about uh, a few minutes ago was the, the apparent uh, conflict between a household position uh, of re representing the defendant, if mm -hmm. you will, and the Unical case representing uh, Mesa and Acquire. And so in, in your argument in household, there is a point at which you do reference Unical and you mentioned to the court that you're not going to re-argue that case. The courtroom kind of burst into laughter. And then you mentioned, you know, but I will be happy to re-argue it if you'd like. I see Mr. Sparks <laughs> yeah. is, uh, you know, in the courtroom. How, how did you, I mean, there's also a very famous uh, cartoon, very famous in, in my world, cartoon of you in, in a newspaper where you're holding the scales of justice and household is on one side and Unical is on the other side. How did you, in your mind, distinguish those two cases, because exactly, in one, you're representing Boone Pickens, who was perceived to be the raider, um, and you know, there was a defensive mechanism in place on household, obviously, we're representing the defendant who had imposed the defensive mechanism. How did you, in your mind, kind of square those two things? Well, to me, they were, they were separate, and it sort of came on the tradition that our firm and other firms had for a long time been representing both acquirers and, uh, and acquirees, if you will, corporations, uh, uh, targets. So in a way, that was a problem that our firm and other firms had, had already faced mm -hmm. because we felt we could represent acquirers and could represent targets. And the devices, of course, were different. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rights plan was uh, quite that, different right? than the discriminatory uh, self-tender in, uh, in Unical. Uh, but uh, that question that you asked me did trouble uh, my clients in the household, mm -hmm. or at least uh, the Wachtell Lipton firm. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, they asked me about it, and I told them I didn't think it would be a problem. Uh, but they said, uh, well, I think we're going to come down and watch the uh, household uh, I mean, watch the Unical argument, which went first. The Unical was argued on Wednesday and household the following Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mike Schwartz and, and I think uh, maybe uh, George Katz and about 10 of his colleagues came down and sat in the, uh, in the front row uh, when I argued <laughs> Unical. And not exactly cheering you on. No, <laughs> and it, it did create a sort of uh, uh, a pressure in the back of my mind as to whether or not if I'd said something in, uh, in defense of uh, Mesa and Unical's case, mm -hmm. it would offend my clients in household. But it, it turned out it didn't, that they uh, agreed with me, mm -hmm. that there really wasn't a conflict between the two positions. Well, they were very different devices. I mean, as you right. mentioned, the discriminatory tender offer actually did have an effect on you know, the company, its finances, et cetera, et cetera. Where's the pill? no tax implication, no dilution, and the like. I mean, I think they are kind of fundamentally uh, different uh, devices. Also, I guess one, one question, though. I mean, in, in, in Mesa, you have a real case with Boone Pickens going after the company. In household, you really don't have a present threat. Did, did you think that plaintiffs really didn't have a ripe case? Well, uh, we certainly argued that. Uh, nobody seemed to be really interested in, in, in the ripeness argument. And it, it really turned uh, on, on the fact that, uh, in a way, the, the court said it wasn't ripe. 
uh, not technically on a ripeness argument because it said, look, we can revisit this. Mm -hmm. If household ever uh, tries to utilize the pill right. against an acquirer, then we will look and see uh, what their board directors did and so forth. And mm -hmm. So while ripeness as a legal concept it wasn't effective, uh, the underlying philosophical concept, I think, really won the day. Mm -hmm. And so now the, the, the plaintiffs were trying to attack the pill from a number of different angles, facial validity, equitable considerations. How did you prepare your defense and your defense strategy, and how were you working with the Wachtell Lipton firm in preparing that defense? Um, did you have kind of different folks assigned to different parts of, of, of the defense with, you know, you kind of coordinating the effort, or how did that all work out? Well, I think uh, Wachtell Lipton ran the overall uh, defense. As I recall, uh, Richard Slayton and myself, uh, among others, maybe took the lead in uh, defending their, their uh, directors in the depositions. Uh, but I think at the trial, as I recall, uh, Wachtell Lipton attorneys really uh, handled most of the witnesses. And we uh, assisted in, a, I think, a major way uh, in terms of the briefing and the, uh, and the preparation for the argument. Mm -hmm. And so, so we were involved. Um, Richard Slayton Finger was involved in giving the advice uh, to Households Board. Uh, we had prepared an opinion. Uh, that opinion, essentially the punchline, it was a reasoned opinion, uh, went through the case law that existed at that time, which there had been no case squarely addressing the validity of a pill. We nonetheless said that the rights were valid under Section 157 of the General Corporation Law was our bottom punchline. That opinion, I think, may have been interpreted more broadly than its exact wording by some of the directors on the household board. There's some references in the opinion and some of the other materials suggesting that maybe they thought we had provided them an opinion uh, to the effect that they would be entitled to the presumption of the business judgment rule uh, in, a, in adopting this, whereas our opinion was actually much narrower. Um, but I wanted to kind of address the issue of your thoughts on how well prepared the directors had been and how confident you were on the record going in just on a do care basis. Well, of course, we were not uh, present uh, at the directors meeting uh, and, and were not involved in their uh, preparation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we only uh, became involved uh, with the directors when their depositions were taken. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the uh, rights plans are so f familiar to lawyers and investment bankers and even maybe uh, business people that it, it doesn't seem uh, complicated, but I can tell you when those depositions were taken, it seemed very, very complicated, and uh, Rod Ward, among others, I think, did a very good job of trying to tangle the directors up in terms of their uh, understanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that uh, the plaintiffs could have done uh, a more forceful job uh, in, uh, in the litigation in, in trying to to pound away at did the directors really understand what they were mm -hmm. doing. And, and it seemed, and, and you know, a rights plan, and this was an early stage rights plan with just a flip over provision, but nonetheless, pretty complicated document based on an indenture, anti-destruction clauses and the like. It, it, I would imagine, would be fairly easy, particularly at the time. I mean, we have to kind of take ourselves back to, you know, a lot of times you see these opinions from the Supreme Court and you think they were always there. You know, that was always right. the holding. It always had to be such. That wasn't the case. I mean, you were in an area where this was an absolutely novel device, and you've got a lot of directors who are reading, you know, 30, 40 pages of a very highly technical, highly specialized document. I imagine there had to be a little bit of concern on your part that they were going to get tripped up in depositions, and, you know, the plaintiffs would be able to use that to uh, demonstrate that, in fact, you know, they didn't know what they were doing. I mean, this is at a time where we were in the Smith, Van, you know, Smith v. Van Gorkum era. Um, a lot of concerns on that front? Well, there were at the time. I mean, if you were there uh, with the directors and then talked to them afterwards in between times, mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was pretty clear that some of them, their understanding was uh, to be charitable, only general in terms of what it was doing. And... Uh, so it seemed uh, more vulnerable, uh, the case seemed more vulnerable when you were there present with them. Mm 
as the case turned out, as it was argued, uh, because it wasn't pushed uh, so much by Skadden, mm -hmm. that kind of disappeared as to be a major concern in mm -hmm. terms of it didn't seem to us to be a, a risk mm -hmm. of the case by the time we, we, we got to court or got to the Supreme Court. And certainly the Chancery Court was fairly charitable and, and understood that the directors didn't need to understand all the hoary details of a rights plan and they had a basic understanding that it was a defensive mechanism and that it would deter uh, takeover proposals. Uh, and then the Supreme Court likewise was was fairly charitable on that front. Um, but I want to turn now to you know the boardroom dynamic and how you dealt with it in the litigation because the company household was was represented by Wachtell, Richard Slayton provided its opinion. They also had Goldman Sachs in as their investment uh, banker and advisor. And they had a representative of, uh, you know, John Whitehead was on the board. He was a Goldman uh, guy. He, he was the chairman of he Goldman. He was the chairman. He didn't vote in favor of the pill. How did that affect your defense? Did you see that as a, as a real weakness in your case, or was it just? Well, he made pretty clear that, that he didn't vote in favor of the pill, not on policy grounds uh, as to whether it was legal or not legal, or, uh, or whether it was a good thing, but he thought it was going to uh, draw too much attention uh, to household and, and maybe would make household really more of a target. Mm -hmm. So that uh, he didn't oppose it. Uh, I suppose that's a kind of on the merits of uh, opposition, but really on the merits of the legality of the thing or whether or not there was a threat to household. You know, there was no uh, 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 tender offer for household, mm -hmm. but you remember the testimony was, and it was quite, it was quite believable and true that, that household was nevertheless suffering or would suffer mm -hmm. by the notion that it could be easily take over in terms of trying to attract people to come to work. If, if, if mm -hmm. your company is on the cusp of being taken over, we had learned through our experience in the previous five years mm -hmm. that you can't attract executives, you can't attract people to come. Mm -hmm. And so you may not be able to retain the executives who don't know for whom they'll be working. Right. So there was a, uh, a current threat to uh, household in that sense. And now was, was, was that compounded by household's composition? I mean, this was a company that had financial services, rental cars, and grocery stores. You know, so the synergies are natural, right? You can borrow money to rent a car to go buy groceries. Uh, you know, I, did, did that composition of the company, in, in your mind, make it more you know, vulnerable to a, a, a raider who would then try to break up the individual components? Well, I think so, because as you've described it, you could, you could disaggregate those components, and that was what Raiders were doing at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, they were they were figuring out a way to make more money by dividing these conglomerates up into separate parts and selling them off. And the um, and so as we as we talk about kind of where household was, what it was like, they had aboard the you know, sixteen directors, ten of whom were independent, non management. Was that in your experience? fairly unique at the time, or were we starting to get into the era where boards were composed mostly of, of outside independent directors, uh, at least in the public company space? Or? No, I think that was a favorable. Uh, there were other companies, of course, that had a majority of outside directors, but I don't think most companies did uh, by 1985. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was that was a new idea, and it was something that the uh, Delaware Supreme Court was pushing in its decisions by talking about the benefit of having a number of outside directors and mm -hmm. outside direct. And, and in Unical, you remember the uh, Unical board had the outside directors meet separately, separately. in order to try to get uh, you know the maximum benefit out of that. Mm -hmm. And you have all the decisions talking about well, we'll give material enhancement, and but then was that a was that something that you pressed in the in the defense in the litigation? That you know we've got these folks who are not just looking to to keep their own seats; they're outsiders. They're yeah. I I, I don't recall stressing that in that case mm -hmm. in household. Interesting. And so, as, as we think through kind of where you were and and what we were looking at at, at the time, how, how did how did you manage just you know as a general matter to get everything done? I mean, this is before word processing. You look at the briefs, they're, you know, 100 pages long. Well, that was horrendous, really, because uh, 
we used to talk about the turnaround of the briefs. You, you, in order to get the things done in a short period of time, and this applies more to, to Unical because of the time constraints than, than household, but you would have different people writing different sections of the brief. Now, these were people who had worked together a lot. So we made the analogy among ourselves, it's like a basketball team, you know, you can make the blind pass to your right if you're pretty sure where the guy's going to be. But, so you, you had an a organizational meeting and you divided up uh, sections of the brief, uh, maybe there are going to be six or seven sections of the brief, and then uh, you can't really see it all until they uh, put it together because you're not able you're not able to change it on a computer. Mm -hmm. So then you're waiting at two o'clock in the morning until you have a run through of the brief. Maybe not till four o'clock in the morning, and then you can read it through from front to back. Mm -hmm. Whereas up to then you've just been reading, you know, John's That's section and Charlie's pieces. section and Fred's section, and uh, so that required. Uh, a lot of late nights and uh, early morning work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, was, it was burdensome. And uh, so, so you're reading briefs, preparing. How are you preparing for your oral argument at the same time? Well, I guess you're doing that in your mind as you're reading the briefs. You're thinking about the, uh, the, the argument. And uh, eventually you, uh, in effect, uh, extract from your briefs. I mean, in household, we had some time. So you extract from your briefs the different uh, arguments that you're going to make, and then you sort of line them all up. And uh, as we were discussing earlier, that, that really doesn't make for a, a very smooth argument. Uh, the uh, the, the Wachtell Liptons, they wanted to know uh, how my argument was going to go. Mm -hmm. So they came down the uh, day before, and we had a practice session in our conference room. And I think there were about 15 of them there. And I knew from previous experience with them that as our firm, there would have been a different, a different guy would have been responsible for a different section. And they were all sitting there. And so when I made my arg oral argument, I knew from previous experience that each one would want to make sure that I uh, had included his point. Mm -hmm. Well, that really wasn't the best way to make an oral <laughs> argument to the Delaware Supreme Court. First of all, they would never permit you to drone through your <laughs> brief from front to back. And secondly, uh, maybe two-thirds of the arguments really weren't important by the time you got to the uh, Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So as I think uh, we've discussed, the, the, uh, the rehearsal didn't really go so well. And the, the, uh, <laughs> a lot of hurt feelings. Uh, yeah. you, know, you didn't well, really stress my part of the argument as well, much as yeah, uh, you and, should and, have. And, and so I'm going to be making the argument the next day, and they're coming. I'm realizing the rehearsal didn't go very well, and they're telling me uh, nicely they didn't think the rehearsal very, very, very well. And I said, well, that's really not what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to start, and the Supreme Court's going to start asking questions, and it'll be free-flowing, and it'll be based upon my knowledge of the case, not what I've uh, written down as a prepared argument. And that's what happened. And so now I want to pick up on that point, because that's, that's pretty interesting in terms of your talking to them about how the argument would proceed and how the Supreme Court would react. So when we go back to you know, the early 80s, mid 80s, was that a time when you, know, you and some of your colleagues here and in other firms throughout Wilmington had somewhat of an advantage in terms of knowing the judges uh, a lot better knowing the procedures in the Court of Chancery. Uh, was that something that factored into your practice and, and kind of gave you a, a leg up? I think so. Um, uh, really, before the takeover battles, um, in generally New York or LA Council and so forth, would uh, rely on Delaware Council to make uh, all of the arguments because to some extent to them, the Delaware law, at least from a litigating point of view, was an arcane, specialized subject. Mm -hmm. They knew the Delaware bar was small. They knew the Delaware courts were small. And they uh, perceived that we would have an advantage knowing personally the judges. Now, over time, that changed because uh, more and more uh, out-of-town counsel began to make arguments. But I think what also changed for them is Prior to 1980, uh, in legal education, Delaware judges did not 
appear on panels. Mm -hmm. And uh, they decided for various reasons we could go into to appear on panels. Mm -hmm. And so the leading lights from New York and elsewhere would be on the same panels. And then uh, and they'd talk uh, in preparation for their panel and afterwards and there'd be dinners at these mm -hmm. uh, seminars and conferences and they would get to know each other. So gradually, and, and the body of Delaware Corporation law grew tremendously. You know, mm -hmm. we just had a few cases a year, let's say prior to 1980, when the takeover battles came, we had many cases. Mm -hmm. And so these people became more knowledgeable, these people being the lawyers from other jurisdictions. And so they gradually became more comfortable. And they said, well, I sat right next to Justice so-and-so at dinner last night. You know, I think I know him. And, and, and there's an advantage to me or my firm if I make the argument rather than, uh, rather than Delaware Council. So gradually, I think uh, what we Delawareans referred to as foreigners began to make <laughs> more arguments. <laughs> more inroads and more arguments yeah. as they became more comfortable with the uh, chancellor, vice chancellor, and the yes. justices. The, um, you know, back to, to, to household specifically, knowing who was on the panel, did you tailor your argument in any specific way to uh, cater to their particular predispositions or predilections? I know this many, yeah. many years ago. Yeah. But no, no, I, yeah, you know, I, uh, the, you know, I think the general uh, feeling among the Delaware bar, you know, outside of uh, us uh, before the argument was that it was a 50-50 shot. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd had uh, Joe Flom had written an article in the Harvard Law Review saying that this was absolutely illegal. And, uh, of course, Marty Lipton put down his stake that this was, you know, absolutely necessary or else Delaware corporations would be swept away by, uh, by acquirers. Um, I thought that uh, one thing we had in, in our advantage was, uh, I think, in general, the Supreme Court was more sympathetic uh, to defendant corporations than it was to acquire. So mm -hmm. if they had a, I wouldn't want to accuse them of bias, but if they had a bias, that was the way they were leaning. And uh, there was no doubt in my mind that that was true of one of the justices that we were going to hear, and that was Justice Moore. And uh, there wasn't much doubt, I think, in the bar's minds that Justice Moore uh, uh, saw himself to be, and uh, the members of the court probably saw him to be as the most knowledgeable of, uh, about corporation law. Mm -hmm. So that he would be uh, probably the person who would be most uh, influential among the panel. So I thought that was an advantage that Household had, and then of course it became a few days later a, a very much of a disadvantage uh, from my client Mesa because, and aside from the bias I've got, uh, uh, Justice Moore uh, had a particular animus against uh, Boone Pickens. Mm -hmm. So you have that problem. Um, I thought what uh, Skadden did was uh, also actually helpful for us. Um, they had Irving Shapiro make the argument for them. Mm -hmm. And of course he was the chairman of the DuPont Company and what more important company in Delaware than the DuPont Company. And he had been chairman of the business round table. So, and he had been a trained litigator, but many years before, 20 mm -hmm. or 30 years before. Uh, and so they were bringing him in to argue, and uh, I sensed, but I can't point to anything in, I sensed that this would happen, and I sensed during the argument that it would happen, that, that while he was very careful not to talk down to the Supreme Court and to tell him really what the law ought to be from my point of view as chairman of the business roundtable. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the whole implication of bringing uh, uh, Irving Shapiro in company, rather than one of the senior skilled litigators from Skadden Arps or Rod Ward in mm -hmm. uh, was, I think, attempting to uh, bully the Supreme Court. and. Uh, uh, I don't think the Supreme Court in general bullies easily, and Drew Moore in particular would mm -hmm. not. So I thought that, uh, I don't think it had anything to do with the outcome of the case, but I thought that was something that, that uh, maybe wasn't successful for them. He may not have been as adept at the ins and outs of the pill and all of the particular technical challenges, or any sense on that? Or Well, I thought that was another thing. I mean, some people said it was sort of... Uh, 
uh, David against Goliath, you know, and of course I was David the youngster and uh, Goliath was uh, Irving Shapiro, but, but uh, I, I don't think it, 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 it turned out that way uh, because in addition to what I've said of, 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 of the court being suspicious that he might be trying to talk down to him and he was careful not to, uh, I also think he wasn't as familiar with the case. I mean, I mean, I had defended most of the depositions, so I had the integral knowledge of what the hat went on there. And of course, I'd sat throughout the trial. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing to sit throughout a trial, and it's another thing just to read transcripts. Mm -hmm. So I felt, uh, I don't know if it shows up in the oral argument, but I felt very confident that I knew the, uh, the record. And so when the argument turned out the way I thought it would, with just questions, mm -hmm. I didn't have to look down at my notes or or, or, or struggle for uh, references to the appendix. I mean, I knew what was in the record, and, and so I thought that gave me an advantage, actually, not mm -hmm. a disadvantage. It, 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 it clearly did, and, and the record, uh, for the record, does show that you did have an incredible mastery uh, of the case, and, and particularly given everything you had going on, uh, I've got to imagine that having lived through all the depositions was tremendously helpful. Um, now, was that pretty common in your experience at, at that time to kind of have you know that level of involvement in a particular case were you mostly when you were involved in cases during this era was it mostly from that angle that you were involved kind of every step of the way yes and indeed really uh, in most cases I think in every case that I can think of and I'm sure there's some exception if I just kept uh, searching my recollection but in every case really I had also tried the case, been the principal trial attorney. In mm -hmm. household, I wasn't the principal trial attorney. So yes, we, uh, I think when, when Richard Slatenfinger and I was hired, we discovered the depositions. I mean, we covered the depositions. We took the depositions. We wrote the briefs, generally pretty much by ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and somebody else would read them in the forwarding firm. And then we argued the cases. And so that gave us a big advantage. And in many cases, we were in the boardroom because mm -hmm. we also had a corporate advisory practice. Mm -hmm. In many cases, and, and in Delaware, as, as you know, we didn't have the sharp distinction between corporate lawyers who went into boardrooms and litigators like mm -hmm. they do in uh, New York or L.A. And uh, so in, in most cases, I mean, like in all the Mesa cases, I was there at the... Uh, at the Mesa board meetings, mm -hmm. or if I was, if, or if it was uh, Time Warner, I was there in the Time Warner board meetings, or Pennzoil, or whatever. So that, of course, gave you a, a much deeper understanding than just hearing what directors said. Mm -hmm. You had your own recollection right. of what occurred at that right. uh, meeting. And in most cases, we had structured the meeting. Mm -hmm. So our recollection would be sharper than the director's because we really understood the structure because in, we had put it together. Involved in engineering it. And yeah. I guess at least my, my follow-up question, which is in, in cases like that and, and in household, as I mentioned earlier, our firm right. you know, gave an opinion that was limited to the rights and the validity of the rights was ultimately understood perhaps by some directors to be a blessing of the entire pill. But when you were in these circumstances, when you're in the boardroom and you're structuring the process, and then you're on the other side defending it, any additional pressure in that situation? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, because now you're you're telling them what to do, uh, more or less, by giving them advice. So uh, you know, if it if it if it doesn't work out well, you were the guy that. Uh, led them uh, down the path that didn't work out well. And so, did you, did you uh, feel in, in household, given that we had rendered a legal opinion, that, that we had exposed ourselves reputationally if this didn't turn out correct, or, or was it? Not so much in some cases, really, because Marty Lipton had thought up the pill, and he mm -hmm. had designed the pill, and, and he was the one at the board meeting. And, and, and remember, Richard Lederfring was not at the board meeting. Right. So in this case, we didn't have that... Uh, I'm talking to you personally, Mr. Director, this is what you ought to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and his prestige uh, was certainly greater than mine. And so I think it was seen to be, you know, a battle between, you know, Lipton and Flom as opposed to, you know, some particular role that Richard Zayn Finger had taken. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, kind of on, on that point, you know, after Household, tremendous victory, I, I imagine 
you know, your friends at Wachtell Lipton were, were very pleased. Did you continue working with them on other cases? Yes, we did. In fact, I was, you know, very uh, pleased that uh, Marty Lipton was quoted in the Wall Street Journal the next day as saying, I'm never going into court again without Charlie Richards. And I thought, wow. The highest wow, price you can get. That, yeah, that's going to be uh, great. And so for, uh, for a number of years, uh, that was true. And then gradually, inevitably, uh, Walk to Lift is quite a big firm, and so other partners would seek other uh, Delaware counsel. And so I can't say that from that point forward, we always represented Walktail Lipton, but we always had a close relationship with them after that. That's great. And so we were talking earlier about your relationship with T. Boone Pickens. Um, any, any fallout as a result of your involvement in household after your victory in household? Was, was Boone Pickens not so pleased with you or did you continue working with him? No, no. Boone Pickens is, uh, that's another story for another thing, but, but he's a great guy and he understood uh, perfectly our role in these cases and uh, he understood that lawyers can take different positions and uh, he was just interested in getting the most skillful representation he could he could get he didn't he didn't think that we were taking a moral position on on one side or, or the other of, of, of these disputes mm -hmm. and, and and now so we we talked about kind of your involvement in the boardroom your preparation and then there are just exogenous factors that that have in you know some impact on a case and, and in the middle you know you have in in household where you know the the plaintiffs are talking about you know this is an absolute it's not just a deterrent it's completely preclusive and yet at the time, you've got Sir James Goldsmith buying through the, the pill at, at Crown Zellerbach. Now, I know some folks on, on the other side of the V thought that was devastating to their case. How did you view that development um, in terms of your defense? Well, it was positive, and we certainly talked about it. Uh, but I didn't really think that it was critical because uh, our defense, or at least in, in my mind, our defense was based on uh, how it is that it turned out, namely that this is a device which gives the board of directors time, and it's not an absolute uh, uh, defeat of any takeover, which is what Skadden Arps tried to say. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, if the pill is, was not taken, it was not withdrawn, then it was an absolute defeat. Mm -hmm. but, but they uh, tried to uh, obfuscate or obscure or not talk mm -hmm. about, hey, but the, the, the board reserves the right to... to uh, redeemable until redeem somebody acquires 20%, and, you know, no issue there, particularly no prevention of a proxy contest. Right, and, and so that's... To the ballot box. If you don't like your board, vote them out. So that, that's, that's where, where we hung our hat, and that's where the Supreme Court came out. And, and so... I didn't think the case was dependent upon, which I, I thought was a one-off of Sir James Goldsmith going forward and, and proving that the pill wasn't effective. I think we pretty much conceded that the oral argument that if the pill was pretty uh, effective. It's very potent. You know, we talked about <laughs> Sir James Goldsmith, but it, I, I think that... It's a great deterrent. It's a, just about five minutes of, a, of the talk. Mm -hmm. So now I, I have to ask you, you know, like, like I said, it, when we read these cases now, it seems like it had always been the case and, and everybody should have known that it would come out this way. How did you feel at the time? Did you think you were going to win? Well, I, I, I wish I could remember exactly what my feeling is because in preparation for this interview, I, I, I've given some thought to that. Um, I think I was, uh, you know, optimistic and hopeful, but uh, the whole world was sort of saying it was 50-50. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I certainly wasn't sure that we were going to win. And, uh, and I was certainly delighted and pleased when we did. Mm -hmm. Did the court get it right? Oh, yes. Oh, I think so. I, I mean, there was a terrible mess going on. Uh, indeed, the, the, the mess is... is very well illustrated by the defense that uh, Unical came up with. I mean, people were coming up with really desperate measures mm -hmm. as to how to defend their companies. And uh, the genius of uh, Lipton's pill was this was a defense that made people stop. It was an absolute defense, but it didn't inflict any harm on the company. It didn't inflict any permanent change. And, and the court could be, I mean, the, uh, the company could be put in a position where the directors would be compelled to redeem the pill. Whereas the discriminatory tender yeah. offer in 
Unicam. Or, or, the, or the, the white knight or the dismemberment of the company or the issuance of diluting uh, stock to everybody. All those other things uh, did a lot of damage to companies. And now as, as a result of, of, of you know, kind of your, your successful defense of household, did you see a, an increase in the number of uh, instances in which we were advising on poison pills and you particularly? Well, yes, I mean, I, I think the, the history is that about 300 major companies adopted uh, poison pills uh, within the year. Um, and, uh, and certainly we uh, gave a lot of advice on that, and a lot of that was sought through our friends at uh, Wachtell Lipton. I mean, they might have the client, but now they had somebody, Richard Lehner Finger, who was uh, most experienced and could give the Delaware opinion. So uh, uh, the firm as a whole did that. I didn't do too many of those uh, because I was sort of busy litigating some other defense. Mm -hmm. And uh, my partner, Don Bazard, you know, took the leading role and there was a group of people uh, here in our pharmaceutical department who uh, adopted pills for people. <laughs> It's a good way to put it. Well, Mr. Richards, I, I really enjoyed the discussion. I, I, I thought, you, you know, reading, reading your, your argument, the transcript of your argument was, was a delight, uh, and I really enjoyed talking to you. Well, thank you. It was fun for me to come back to this, uh, what, 33 years later. <laughs>